Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the virtual book launch of Future Tense, Reflections on My Troubled Land by Tony Leon. My name is Jennifer Malik. I'm the editor of The Reading List, and we are hosting this launch tonight along with Jonathan Ball Publishers. In conversation with Tony Leon this evening is Valdemar Pelser. Valdemar is the editor of Report and the host of Cake Net for Slack in Kasprek. Sorry, that was uh, my Afrikaans sort of failed me there, but I can pronounce it, but I won't do it again. Uh, um, and um, we're very glad to have him uh, in conversation with Tony this evening. I'm sure he's going to give him some tough questions or maybe some just a, a, a nice conversation for us all to enjoy from the comfort of our own homes. Um, the featured author this evening is Tony Leon, the author of five books. And um, Tony's the longest serving leader of the op official opposition in the Parliament of South Africa since the advent of democracy. He served afterward as South African ambassador to Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay. He's a qualified attorney and a constitutional law lecturer and served for 20 years as member of parliament and played a leading role in the constitutional negotiations which birthed modern South Africa. He is currently chairman of Resolve Communications and lives in Cape Town. In his riveting new book, Future Tense, which I have here, as you can all see, beautiful cover. Um, um, it's the book we're launching this evening. Tony captures and analyzes recent South African history with a focus on the squandered and corrupted years of the past decade. <clears throat> I believe the book was written um, during the first coronavirus lockdown, um, and it examines the surge of the disease and the response, both of which have crashed the economy and its future prospects. So it's a, it's a, um, a fascinating book to, to read at the moment. Um, future Tense is out now from Jonathan Bull Publishers, and it's available for purchase at all good bookstores and online for the rec recommended retail price of 275 Rand. Um, please leave your questions about the book or your questions for Tony or even Valdemar in the comments section wherever you're watching this video on Facebook or on YouTube. Um, we'll hand over those questions to Tony and Valdemar at the end of the launch after about 45 minutes of chat. So if you have any burning questions that you're wanting to ask, feel free to do so in the comments section. Without further ado, let me hand over to Valdemar and Tony and enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you very much. Tony, congratulations on what I believe is book number five. Uh, the, first, the first one since 2014. And you note in the subtitle, Future Tense, Reflections on My Troubled Land, that indeed we are in quite a fix. Um, and in your attempt to establish how we got where we are, uh, you touch on uh, cancel culture. Uh, you talk about immigration. Uh, should, should one uh, fight or, or flee? Um, and you ask, interestingly, uh, whether state overreach mid-pandemic, which many of us have gotten to know, might become a permanent feature like detention without trial did in the 60s, uh, the permanence of the temporary, um, you call it. Uh, Dennis Davis has referred to your new book as a lucid analytical balance sheet of SALTD 2021, and Niall Ferguson, the, uh, the historian, says you unflinchingly anatomize what has gone wrong in South Africa since the heady days when you entered politics. Now, Jennifer mentioned that you were the longest serving opposition leader. To date, though, the official opposition has had eight leaders. Um, and yet, in the same period, South Africa has had only four and a half presidents, as you noted yesterday in the Sunday Times. And yet, while we're so fully captured in South Africa by the ANC's view of the world, the official opposition seems stuck at 20%. And I'll get to that a bit later in our conversation, but I want to ask you first about the future, which according to so many South Africans hinge on one man, and that is Cyril Ramaphosa, who doesn't get a very flattering assessment in your in your book. You list his handling of ESCOM. He only visited the Madupi power station in November 2019 for the very first time, five years after being appointed to fix ESCOM. South Africa was downgraded to junk status under, under him, not under Jacob Zuma. And we voted to change the constitution under Ramaphosa instead of Zuma. Is Ramaphosa, Tony, uh, one of the good guys? Well, I think, you know, as Bill Clinton once said memorably when he came to South Africa to General Fulyun uh, at a tea party I was present at, uh, it, everything in politics and life is compared to what? And, you know, compared to Ace Makashula or Didi Mabuza, he's fantastic. Compared to the best proactive, bold, uh, forward-looking president, he's pretty bad. So, but you, you know, you've got to work with the world that you're in, not the world that you wished it was, uh, however much we might hope that there might be substantive change. You know, I, 
I've known Cyril not particularly well since 1990. We met in Kempton Park and we've uh, had a cordial but very distant relationship. He's what, you know, you'd, the readers of report would call a chladebeck. I mean, he speaks incredibly well. He's reassuring. I describe him as like an old style country GP, you know, doctor. The diagnosis he gives might be terrible, but it is very reassuring in the way he delivers it. And people feel a bit better, even if the condition is terminal. Uh, so, you know, he and, and he can read a set of figures, which certainly is an improvement on Jacob Zuma. But uh, I'm the while well, you can say the jury's out, you know, he, he promised. In fact, when I was in New York and I, the book starts with a chapter about um, me uh, attending a, a Sir Ramaphosa uh, chit chat in at the Intercontinental Hotel in New York in November or September 2018. And, you know, he'd, he'd said to the Wall Street Journal on the morning of the talk, reforms have been a bit slow, but they're going to come fast and furious. Now, it's worth noting, and that's why this book is actually very current, it's not dated, that all the reforms he promised have yet to actually materialize, whether it's the division of ESCOM, whether it's the so-called Tito Treasury paper. I mean, none of it's actually been realized. I mean, God forbid... Uh, even allowing alternative electric, uh, uh, energy onto the ESCOM grid. That's still contested space. The spectrum auction hasn't happened. Now, you know, I, I analyze in, in one of Cyril's speeches, I think it was 2019, State of the Nation, where he actually, every major problem, there was a committee or a commission. And my old uh, comrade, he yeah, doesn't have comrades, but friend, Douglas Gibson, you know, one said, well, you know, de Villiers Croft's uh, method of dealing with the problem was when in doubt, Div appointed a committee. So, you know, I, I don't want to disparage de Villiers Croft because he was only the leader of the opposition. But I mean, appointing committees, commissions, kicking things into touch is not what you require. South Africa requires action this day. And I'm afraid in the main, on the evidence, not on, you know, the fact that uh, I belong to a different party to Sir Ramaphosa, he's been missing an action. Uh, this crisis, the extent of our crisis, though, Tony, you suggest, of course, requires strong leadership instead of this eternal um, attempt by the president to achieve consensus. And you mentioned at some point that uh, that uh, what we hoped for uh, in 2018 was a de Klerk moment, um, you know, who, who, who went on in, in 1990 to do quite brave things, but his party didn't exist some years later. So perhaps one could say he, um, if he were to be generous, he saved the country but destroyed his party. What would a de Klerk moment uh, require of Ramaphosa in 2021? Well, you know, uh, obviously I, I was in Parliament when de Klerk, my first day when de Klerk made a speech in 40 minutes, he took over the Democratic Party agenda. He actually just pretty much annihilated the Democratic Party in one speech. Um, and, you know, he took pull the country back from the brink of a racial civil war, uh, for which he gets very little credit. And we I interrogate some of that in this book as well. Um, but th the reality is that Ramaphosa would have to face down the RET, I call them the economic Taliban faction in his party. He would have to make some competent uh, cabinet appointments. I, I mean, bear in mind, uh, during the height of, and it was really a, practically a civil war where de Klerk was being pummeled from the right and from the left, and there was violence all over the place. I mean, de Klerk, whom, you know, has a mixed bag in terms of what he achieved and what he says he achieved, but I deal with that as well. De Klerk fired 17 generals or 19 generals from the South African Defence Force, whom he said were, were actively resisting the change agenda and the constitutional negotiations, and perhaps fueling the third force violence. And when the ANC was putting huge pressure on him because of the township violence, which they were somewhat complicit in, he also, you know, removed his minister of police, Adrian Flock, and his minister of defense, uh, Magnus Milan. And these were very powerful figures in terms of the then National Party, what you might call the Afrikaner establishment or the status quo establishment. So it wasn't just he made a big speech, but... As we say in Afrikaans, he was consequent. He, he was logical in how he followed through on it. And I've never seen that from Ramaphosa. I mean, you see these sort of, you know, dreadful people in the cabinet. I, I mean, if there are five people in the South African cabinet who are good at their job, that's probably the totality of it. If and some of them are deeply corrupt, highly compromised, 
ethically problematic. I mean, we've got a deputy minister who apparently was the bag carrier of the money to go and bribe judges with, according to uh, credible evidence given by his own director general of intelligence. These are not that these people still remain in public life is entirely in the gifts of Sir Ramaphosa. So to go back to your original question, Valdemar, of course, he has said that he preferences the unity of his party over being a strong president. That's a matter of record uh, that he, he said during the uh, mid-year last year. So I, I don't think it's going to happen, but hope springs eternal. Uh, but until or unless he does so act, we're going to at best you know, keep coasting along at the bottom where we are economically, where we are socially, where we are in terms of uh, of uh, any investor confidence in this country. And we're going to run out of money, which is, is a big theme in the book as well. And these are concerns, Tony, shared widely in the commentariat, uh, those that you've just mentioned. And, and yet voters have kept on um, uh, delivering strong mandates uh, for the ANC, albeit with a ever lower share of voter participation since 1994. Um, and you mentioned interesting examples here of how long this liberation dividend lasted in some other countries. In, in Mexico, I think it was, was it 71 years, and in Ireland, 61, um, and 30 years in India. We're now in year number 27 uh, for the ANC. Uh, should we expect them, Tony, to, uh, to last um, uh, until 71 years in power, or are we, are we, closer, to, are we closer to them um, becoming politically irrelevant, um, as perhaps the Congress Party did in, in India? You know, I, I put all the evidence out there in the last chapter. I called it Judgment Day, because I, I, I did actually think very carefully about when does this liberation ticket expire? And, and I thought actually the two most interesting examples were India and Israel because they were one-party dominant systems, the party of government from 1947, in India's case, Congress Party, and in Israel, the Mapai uh, Labour Party alignment, um, were in power for 30 years unbroken, and they completely dominated the society. It wasn't just they were the governing party. Uh, I, I remember when I met uh, Ariel Sharon when he was Prime Minister of Israel, he, of course, was formed the Likud opposition, and he, he told us something interesting, which I repeat in the book. He said, you know, at a uh, if you want to become promoted to the general ranks, the Israel Defense Force, you needed a Labour Party membership card. He, of course, was not, he, he defected from Labour and started Likud. So it's not that the ANC alone has practiced catered deployments. It's not that the ANC alone has got to be corrupt. Both those parties became highly compromised, highly corrupt, and they failed in their essential purpose, which was obviously separate in the case of India and Israel. And then they were voted out. And although they came back to power in various forms once or twice afterwards, today they are splinters uh, in the parliament and of no electoral significance at all in either country. And, you know, because things speed up in a country, and one of the chapters is called Warp Speed Changes Everything, with an acknowledgement of Star Wars, I mean, I don't think it's 70 years. I don't know if it's going to be 30 years, but at some point... It's, it's going to change. And people who think there is no possibility of the ANC ever losing power are wrong. I, you know, I grew up under, well, Valdemar, you're much younger than me, but the National Party was this dominant political force of my childhood, of my adulthood. My first election to Parliament, the National Party, although they were below 50% because of constituencies, had 65% of all the seats in the National Assembly when I was elected to it. And Within one election, they were gone, and within two elections, they didn't exist. So, you know, nothing is forever. And I think that's a sign of hope. But, I mean, what comes afterward is a matter of contemplation and conjecture, which I also look at some of those variables. Uh, because, only interestingly, you do not um, only examine the Zuma years uh, when you try to show where we went astray. Um, you go as far... Oh, sorry, you, you've broken sorry. up. Huh? Yeah, I sorry, I'm, I'm back. You go as yeah. far back as the Mandela years, in fact, when the foundation was laid for uh, what we know today as CADA deployment. Uh, why was more protest not voiced um, in those early days, 1997, um, when these policies were, uh, were, 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 were articulated for the first time? I think because of the magnificence, and really, you know, he was a magnificent president. My last book was called Opposite Mandela. He, he, so many things that went wrong, he did a huge number of things right. 
but uh, there was, you know, uh, the scaffolds of economic forward destruction were being erected on his watch and with his connivance. And, you know, I did draw attention to them, but I was just the leader of the Democratic Party and then the Democratic Alliance. So, I mean, I remember one stage I, I said that these politics are destructive. I remember I alone, well, not my party alone in Parliament, uh, I with seven seats at the time, opposed the uh, Employment Equity Bill precisely because of the racial percentages it mandated, which have now become the iron law of everything in South Africa. The Labour Relations Act we opposed not because we didn't want good labor relations, because we didn't think that tens of thousands of small businesses and millions of workers should be subject to edicts that they had no control over, uh, over drafting. And, you know, he's a very good cartoonist, but Zapiro, who captured what you might say the, uh, the, the, the zeitgeist of the time or the sort of the what in the Volksmund was von die Mierreit von die, uh, von die Mensa, he had a picture of me dressed up as that, you know, the, the, one of these lunatics going around town saying the end of the world is nigh. So, you know, to, to, to take a different view then, you were regarded as sort of, it was almost like attacking the flag because you were pointing out that, well, hang on, this is very good. We've got this rainbow nation. It's wonderful that we're reconciling. But if you introduce laws like this, if you put down markers like these, you are storing up trouble for the future. And, and I remember the Employment Equity Bill, I, which I led the opposition to, and there were only seven of us in Parliament to vote against it. I um, said that this is a pernicious and destructive piece of social engineering. Well, you know, I, I, I noticed last year during the height of the coronavirus, the man who correctly probably stars himself as the, um, as the biggest single taxpayer in this country, Johan Rupert, described the edicts, which all built on this foundation coming out of the National Coronavirus Command Council as social engineering by decree. The only difference between Johan and me is it has been so for the last 30 years. But now, in a, in a no-growth, uh, investor-reduced uh, economy with, you know, 10 million people out of work, it's, it's the, the chickens have come home to roost. And, you know, I don't want to be one of these gloom buckets that says, you know, I was right, you were wrong, so where, where, where? I, I, I'm not that. But there were always people who said so far and no further, but those voices were isolated. Uh, and Tony, the sister policy to employment equity, uh, black economic empowerment, um, is, is also in the news. The president recently recommitted uh, to making requirements for BE even more stringent. And now you cite in your book, uh, the Mbeki years, you say a big ticket item such as the notorious arms deal and his obsessive determination to create a new elite via BEE opened the floodgates to corruption through public procurement. Do you think that the benign BEE is possible? Oh, I absolutely think it is. The question is who you're going to empower. You're going to empower the folks at the bottom of the pile or the elite at the top of the pile. And I think a, a BEE, which focuses on the excluded majority, is an excellent idea. But, but you know, how you do it versus how we have done it is all the difference in the world. And, and, and I give some examples of that. You know, the real problem is, I mean, let's take a chap. He's probably got the most difficult job in South Africa, other than Paul's, uh, you know, Andre Dorator. So Andre Dorator is the CEO of ESCOM, seems to be in impossible circumstances, uh, doing a creditable job. I don't know, the lights are on as we speak, so thank God for that. But, uh, you know, he, he now starts to clear out of ESCOM the, uh, the, a, a corrupt procurement system. The moment he does it, he is accused of um, targeting black people. Well, it's not that he's targeting black people, he's targeting corruption. But if the whole edifice is built on racial compartmentalization, in other words, using race as a criteria rather than disadvantage as a criterion, then that's going to be the reaction when the people, the forces who resist change are exposed. And you've kind of, you've set up a, a noose for your own neck when you try and bring about the change. It, it, you know, one of the lines, I had a brilliant editor called Tracy Hawthorne, but she was merciless. So... I, she, she took out a lot of my more florid phrases, but I mean, you know, uh, Al Capone once said of Chicago, I think it was, he said, you know, the amazing thing about Chicago is not what's illegal, but what is legal. And, you know, for example, and I, and I use an example, so Belek and Beta, not my favorite human being in the world, who's, you know, 
gave me terrible grief when she was a Speaker of Parliament because she saw her job not as protecting Parliament, but protecting uh, the ANC and later Jacob Zuma. I mean, she got given with no experience in mining or anything to offer other than her position, 25 million rand for the in, in the Goldfields Empowerment deal. Now, along with a convicted criminal who put the, 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 the package together, which was, of course, green-lighted by the Department of Mineral Resources. Now, you've got to say to yourself, what sort of crazy town is this? You know, what has Beleka and Beta got to actually offer a, a mining company other than her political credentials? And no doubt because, you know, she's a certain woman of a certain color and, and with gender. I mean, it's just, it's crazy. So you've mixed in your example uh, corruption and empowerment policy. Uh, the two do not always go uh, hand in hand. But I'm curious, uh, though, uh, wh whether you think that corruption or bad policies have done have done us more harm. Well, I, I suspect, well, it's a combination. I mean, you know, the, the Guptas wouldn't have been able to flourish if we had good pol policies. And I mean, how an Aravista family who arrived here, you know, after all the shots had been fired and all the wounded had been taken off the battlefield and then presented themselves as a face of empowerment, is, is so staggering, you've, you've got to kind of, you know, draw breath and say, how did this happen? Um, how were these people the advance guard of state capture? But according to Sura Ramaphosa, we, we've lost nearly one trillion rot to state capture. But it, it was, you know, in, 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 in all the corruption at ESCOM with, with, with the coal and, and the, you know, fact that beauticians in Johannesburg were suddenly emerging as, as, as coal moguls and so on, You've got to say to yourself that um, they used the legislative framework, although there was obviously a lot of illegality around it, to drive this through. And not questions weren't asked because they said, oh, well, this is pro-empowerment. This is good for transformation. But what sort of transformation, what cost, that was never asked until it was obviously too late. And now poor Justice Zondo has to trundle through millions of pages of evidence to try and rescue us from what happened. And one minister who has um, emerged uh, with a pristine record from the Zondo Commission um, is is Pravin Gordon. Now, I'm not sure whether you were referencing him in this lovely anecdote, which uh, which I would want to share with uh, viewers. You write, in January 2015, I led a company group to a meeting with a government minister whom I'd known since the early 90s. As we waited in the sparsely furnished ante room outside his office in Pretoria, one of our party inquired, what's the minister like to deal with? So you said, Tony, I'll give you the good news first. He's honest, so there'll be no question of anything improper. He's also intelligent and industrious. You can rest assured he'll be properly briefed and able to engage fully on topic. The bad news is, you said, that he's totally ideological. If your request aligns with his ideology, you'll be fine. If not, forget about it. Does that provide? No, actually, it isn't. It's another commie minister who I... Uh, and, and let me just say this, you know, I, I really like Praveen. I, I've known Praveen... I don't, in fact, I've known him. I don't want to, you know, turn this into Spike Milligan, Hitler, my role in this downfall. You know, I'm, I'm not claiming that we have an intimate relationship, but I've known Praveen very well since 1990 from those negotiations. And we, we spent a wonderful three days together in Argentina. And I'm a few, and I brought him to Argentina as the Minister of Finance, the Argentines couldn't believe him. They, they, well, you know, what a thoughtful man. I mean, they had a real sort of hardline ideologue, Minister of Finance. Uh, and, and Praveen, by contrast, you know, was, was, was quite magnificent to what was on offer by the Argentinian government of Kirchner at the time. But Praveen, you know, has his ideology. And um, his ideology, we see it in, in South African Airways, which is, uh, there is a chapter on the book because I spent a lot of my years dealing with SAA's travails, as, as I illustrate there. Um, and uh, there, there's no justification at all. But the fact is, that description, Praveen is absolutely honest. He's highly intelligent. It didn't have to be that particular minister. Uh, but Praveen's a communist. And, and I'm not saying that as a slur. It's a fact. And the ideology is that the state knows best and, and state control is the way to go. But, you know, uh, it, it, when every piece of evidence, every rare nation, you know, we've got 700 state-owned companies in this country, Valdemar, and you, you, your newspaper report has done a lot to expose a rot at a lot of them. How many, you know, could, could function without bailouts? How many have not been riddled with corruption, with cronyism? And I don't doubt 
Provin's sincerity, I, and many of his colleagues, I doubt both his sincerity and competence. I don't doubt his competence, but I think sometimes you can be very sincere, very competent, very honest, but you have these ideological blinkers which narrow you to a range of options that are available on the table, but actually implementing them is too difficult. I just want to push you on uh, your citing of his his uh, uh, communist loyalties for a moment. So communists, um, you know, have also been on the right side of history in a few major conflicts. And one could uh, well argue they were on the right side of history in South Africa. Um, uh, and and um, just on, uh, on, 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 on this uh, bouquet of policies that the ANC has been offering voters, Voters have chosen this again and again, um, and the commentariat has critiqued it, and, and these critiques have become more biting over the years. But this is what voters have claimed to want, Tony, over the years. Um, are we not at risk of arrogantly saying voters want the wrong thing? Well, I, you know, why do people go and make a cross? I mean, I, I don't want to go into the merits of why I vote DA. I mean, it's sort of, I guess, Merkin being... DA on the Siena. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I suppose because I spend most of my adult life in the DA or the DP or the progressives. So I rock up every five years. I vote for the DA. I might think very little of of of, of the then leadership or you know the the local council or whatever it is. But I tend to vote for them out of a sense of you know deep loyalty. So I'm not in a position speaking to you tonight to say do people when they go and vote actually, uh, you know, subscribe to the joined up manifesto, because what's interesting to me, you're quite right, people just don't vote at elections, people express themselves through opinion polls and, and uh, you know, voter things. And, and I think there are two things I would say about my number one, it is a fact, and I, I, I give the figures in, in this book, in one of the chapters. Um, in the last general election, the 2019, only 28% of all potential registered voters cast a vote for the ANC. That's really, they got a very big uh, majority in parliament. However, the National Party, when it had went under 50%, still had a big majority in parliament. So I, I wouldn't divine, you know, the, the millions of voters didn't register. They were out, they, they had lost faith in the system. Millions more were registered, about more than a third of them didn't bother to pitch up on election day to vote. So it's a kind of passive form of negation. And then what really interested me just before election day last time is a ENCA and R.W. Johnson did a poll, which with the results of which are in the book, which actually said on a range of issues, most voters who were presumably still voting the ANC actually didn't approve of ANC policies. And whether it was, you know, affirmative action policies, whether it was land redistribution, they wanted something else. They wanted good jobs and they wanted good education that beats everything else. So, you know, you might say, I, I mean, you know, the, the same question happens in America. And it was asked by a much cleverer man than me, the award-winning columnist Nicholas Kristof. I happened to be in New York on election day when George W. Bush was re-elected by a significant majority against John Kerry. And he said, why does millions of unemployed waitresses stand online to vote tax breaks for billionaires? Well, they weren't actually voting for the Republican kind of, you know, screw the poor tax breaks or whatever they, Mr. Christoph, who is a liberal, admittedly, in the New York Times, thinks it is. They were voting, and, you know, he suggests was guns, gods, and gays. They were against, though, or for some of those things, against some of the others. In other words, they were voting their values. They weren't voting on economic questions. And Marx would have called that false consciousness. But, you know, I'm not in a position to tell you while the millions of people who rock up and do vote ANC, as opposed to the millions who stay away and don't vote at all or vote for someone else, do that. But the evidence is very mixed of what they're actually voting for. And I suspect over time, and I speculate on that, that that loyalty, that very fundamental loyalty forged in struggle, forged in the fight against apartheid, indeed, as you say, assisted by the communists, not assisted by the West, will lessen over time just because as the years start to recede between that magic moment of 1994 and 2030 or whenever it is. So on that point, my, my former colleague Tim Dupuisi used to say um, that uh, the opposition uh, can't really win an election in this country, but the ANC can lose. Uh, so one shouldn't uh, hope to, to build a 50% plus opposition party, but just hope 
merely to push the ANC below uh, below 50, which the DA now is, is set on doing. Uh, you do suggest, though, yesterday, Tony, in the Sunday Times, that the DA is now, uh, they're becoming a 20% party. I just want to turn to the DA because you were uh, you were key a key member of a, a three a three man panel that assessed why the DA lost some support in twenty uh, in twenty nineteen after trying so hard uh, under Musi Maimane to attract new recruits. Now one would think that um, attracting new recruits is uh, what parties ought to do, um, and yet in his attempts to broaden the uh, the base of the party, uh, Maimane um, flirted with um, so much of the ANC's uh, worldview, even lauding Winnie Mandela uh, at her death, um, uh, whereas whereas the DA's antecedents uh, were were opposed to much of what she stood for. Um, so just these two issues, why do you think the DA has been unable to broaden its base beyond 26 odd percent, which it got in 2016? Um, and did it go too far under my money to just attract, try and attract anybody whatsoever who would uh, who would care to support it? Yeah, well, it, 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 if it had done that and attracted, you know, all manner of people, I'm sure Mr. Maimani would be toasted today as a successful leader of the party who led it to new heights. In fact, uh, the party had its first reverse at the polls under his baton in 2019, and you know, people said, "Oh, well, it only lost, you know, 450,000 votes." In fact. As, as as we point out in that panel, and I repeat in the book, the party had four electoral aims, and that was to win the Western Cape by an increased majority, to uh, win uh, uh, to win more than thirty percent, I think, of the national vote, and to to either to be the to to vote the ANC out of power in Gauteng and Northern Cape. Now, you know, in three out of those four, they failed. The fourth one also was a bit of a reverse because they got fewer votes in the Cape than they'd had under Helen Ziller the election before. So I think it was a failure. It, it was a deep failure. And Maimani recognized the failure. That's why he asked a group of us to uh, examine and interrogate what went wrong and what need to be put right. And we did that. And uh, <laughs> he wasn't very happy with, with the outcome. But he, you know, he asked for it and we got it. And we were honest in our disposition. And we really were refracting back into the party what you know more than 240 people had said to us either verbally or in writing what uh, had gone wrong and what the problems were. And we set out very comprehensively in that panel review how we thought it should be got right. But, you know, it's not that Musi Maimani or anyone else started setting out in 2015 and said, oh, you know, we need to win more votes. We've been trying to do this, I don't know, since time began to be an opposition force that can contend for power. And it's very, very hard. It's harder, perhaps, in a one-party dominant society. It's not just the ANC, as my book explains, and as people, I guess, know. They don't just control the government. They control the civil service. They control the broadcaster. They increasingly control the universities, which are very much in their image and are utterly intolerant of any dissenting views, as you've seen. They control, dare I say, more and more of the media in this country, even the free media, which reflect, reflects an ANC view. So, you know, just getting a shout out in those circumstances, although we are a democracy and says people can go and vote and there's reasonably free and fair elections, is hard. But, you know, the, and, and it's, it's harder still when you have 17 million people in this country receiving some form of social grant. I mean, I do spend some time in the, in the, uh, in the book pointing out that about 125,000 taxpayers are essentially responsible for a big slice of the beneficence of the government. And we better hang on to them, even though the 125,000 voters would only get you about uh, four seats in parliament because they're producing most of the moolah that, um, that pays the grants in this country. But And because the narrative is put out there, well, if you don't vote for the ANC, you're going to lose your support from government. Actually, you might get more uh, if the opposition came in. I think that's taken hold, and it's quite hard to counter that narrative. But, you know, the opposition can't make excuses. They've got to actually up their game. And that that is all. It's not that Musi was a bad person. He was trying to do that. I think he did it in the wrong way, and the results proved it was wrong. But, you know, whoever's in charge of the opposition is going to have to keep trying to do that. And at some point, the nut will crack. You know, you'll crack the nuts. I, I'm a very bad golfer, Valdemar, and... Uh, I do like to play golf, and I 
my, my great moment of triumph was I at, at the golf course, I managed to get a birdie, which is, you know, one under par. And I posted on Facebook and a friend of mine uh, wrote back immediately. He said, even a blind squirrel gets a nut occasionally. So going back to, you know, Tim's point, even if the, if the DA isn't particularly good and competent or well-led, when there's a tipping point, and even if you've got a 20% party and the ANC start splintering and, and, and the votes don't come their way, then that, that 20%, as I said yesterday, can become a real number. So I wouldn't throw up my hands and say, alles verloren, as a, the famous wine farm in Rebeck Vess is, is called. I would say, you've still got to shout and you've got to keep at it. Uh, and 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 some of the success, Tony, of the opposition hinges on the quality of leadership, as you suggest in the book, um, and and yesterday again in your in your column. Um, and the current leader of the DA, uh, John Steiner, as you say, he's often mocked by his opponents for having no university degree. He dubs himself the most famous matriculant in South Africa, a keen autodidact and intellectually curious. He's come up through the ranks, um, but um, you sometimes joke with him. You write in the book. Tony, that he suffers from a birth defect. He's a white male in a country where demography is seen as a determinant of destiny, personal and political. Um, do you see this uh, birth defect, uh, ironically uh, supposing, uh, do you see this mattering less in, in future or are we going the other way? Well, I suppose it depends really on how compellingly the DA can put its offer. I mean, you know, South Africa is suffering from an, an excess amount of mediocre leadership. It's not because the leadership is black. It's because the leadership is mediocre. And there are you know, plenty of white mediocre leaders, even some clever white leaders who are mediocre and thoroughly, how can we say, ethically compromised. You know, a certain major furniture company currently being, uh, being put on trial in Germany. So, you know, there's not a racial point. And the question is, you know, uh, uh, once again, the polls tell us, you know, take them with under advisement, as they say, that actually people want competence, uh, they want uh, decency, they want honesty, and they m that's much more important to ordinary folk than the color of people's skins. And I think we see that, for example, in our schools. I, I mean, one of the madnesses of many, you could write a book called South Africa Madness 2021, is that you know, people sort of saying, we haven't got enough black teachers in, 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 in the staff rooms. Well, that was in the Model C schools and suburbs, but You've got to ask yourself, why do so many black parents vote with their feet and take their kids out of township schools, which are completely under the stranglehold of sad to, and bring them into the suburban schools because they want their kids to get a decent education, to have life chances, to have a chance of decent jobs, decent wages. And they're not much fussed whether the teacher's white, pink or black. They want a good teacher who can get, get their kids the best education. And, and I think that is a universal thing. Now, you know, I, I'm not saying, as I said at the DP when I first led it, that it looked like a combination of the Bruderbund and the Rand Club. I mean, obviously, you, you've got to look like the face of South Africa. But if that becomes a fetish, if that becomes all that you're about, and we can truthfully say the ANC days about patronage and race, it stands for nothing else, and, you know, self-enrichment, not, not much else to say about them, um, and bad governance... If that's all it becomes, it becomes a racial zero-sum game, then, you know, game over, actually. And, Tony, were, you know, were the DA to get stuck at 20 and, and the ANC um, keeps failing, uh, failing especially the poor, uh, one could argue, and our tiny time, we're almost getting to question time, um, one could argue that the potential for uh, a surge in populism uh, definitely increases. And we've seen these surges, you mentioned them in the book, uh, Viktor Orban in Hungary and Trump Bre Brexit. Um, so populisms on the right and the left are on the march around the world, and both of those can do quite, can do quite a lot of harm. Um, but populism can also be an expression, of course, of that which many people want, but the elites are not... Uh, sensitive to. Um, are we overlooking, as the EFF uh, edges above 10%, are we overlooking um, the reason for this 10%, 12% perhaps going forward EFF uh, support? Are we, are we taking seriously enough the concerns of these voters who feel entirely disenfranchised and excluded? No, I, we probably aren't, and I think that is interesting. Look, I mean, it is an interesting phenomenon. I do interrogate in one of the chapters 
because at one level the EFF is an unpopular populist party because in these conditions in South Africa, if uh, the most left-wing radical populist party led by a, a, whatever I think of him, this very charismatic, you know, very uh, electorally very sa savvy chap like Julius Malema, if they can only get 10%, <laughs> you've got to say they're not doing very well. I, mean, I don't think they've won, I don't think they have enough votes to win a single municipal ward outside Rustenburg. They might have won one. I couldn't actually find that out, but apparently there might be one in the platinum belt that they actually won. So, I mean, at one level, they're not doing very well. On another level, as, and this is to me the more interesting question, you put the EFF total with the ANC total, you're back to where the ANC was in 2004. And I do suggest one of the reasons that the EFF has been stalled in this progress, quite aside from VBS Bank and, you know, corruption and, and limits of their campaigning ability because they don't control the state, is perhaps that the ANC has started to adopt the EFF playbook. I mean, where did EWC come from? Expropriation without compensation. Pre well, they haven't introduced prescribed assets. I mean, Eismacher Schuler, you know, is, uh, is is basically hand in glove with the EFF. I mean, we see this with the public protector. There's no difference in the stance of Secretary General of the ANC on this grotesquely incompetent woman who is clearly, you know, sh should be impeached. I mean, you know, on any, any given day, on the prima facie case that's been made out against her by that panel of three. And yet uh, the Secretary of the ANC says uh, we won't vote with the enemy. And that's what Malema says. So, yeah, I think all bets are off as far as the EFF is concerned. And I, I think we must, you know, offer people who feel hopeless and helpless a better alternative. And that's that's what the opposition's got to do. Uh, Tony, just uh, I'm going to conclude before we go to questions with a lovely Zuma anecdote. <laughs> when you were ambassador in Buenos Aires, uh, where you, you helped establish the SIA route uh, to um, to that country, um, you met uh, you met Zuma. Um, I think this was during the World Cup. Uh, oh, you were ex after. just after the World Cup, um, and you told him South Africa and Argentina had much in common. Uh, which country was better governed uh, in those years, Tony? I know what the book says. Oh, South Africa was better governed then, but uh, I made those remarks and, and less corrupt, ironically. But listen, I was ambassador, the, you know, at the beginning of the Zuma years, not at the end of them. Uh, by 2021, Argentina, although it's kind of more fine, uh, well, Argentina is more economically incompetent than South Africa, even on a bad day. But politically, Argentina is uh, better governed than South Africa, and also it, it changes governments. So after I left, my friend Mauricio Macri, who was the leader of the opposition and the mayor of Buenos Aires, you know, he became elected president. But now they, when he tried to introduce reforms, it goes to your earlier point about populism, he was voted out four years later and Mrs. Kirshner is back as the vice president. Yeah, it's absolutely stunning. Um, and um, uh, so, yeah, they were both more cor corrupt and worse governed than we were. Yeah, that, it does seem like a very long time ago. Well, well, um, well, take the now, as we say, huh? In, in, indeed, indeed. Um, Tony, I think we'll we'll go to Jennifer now for some uh, some questions, and if we run out of questions, um, I'll come back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi. Yes, we do have some questions. Um, our first question is a two-parter from Peter Dutoy. He says, "Great book." Uh, let me just bring it up on the screen. So I'll bring one up, and then I'll bring the other up. Great book, Tony. Certainly one of the best writers in Afrikaans. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> Aren't we too hard on Ramaphosa? He's replaced leadership at the NPA and SARS. ESCOM is being cleaned up. He's clearly battling the Magashule RET faction and doing this with a wafer-thin Nazarek margin, which limits his room to move. I'm not sure what your comment would be on that. Oh, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Peter uh, is, a, well, Peter, first of all, is a veteran uh, journalist and a very good writer himself. I only hope my book sells as many as his uh, Stellenbosch Mafia books sold, but uh, it's in a reprint now. <laughs> so I appreciate his, his warm remarks. But, yeah, I, of course I do as a political ex-leader, looking at him as a leader, I have a lot of empathy for his position. But, you know, Peter, my answer to that would be if we had, if we were on Lake Geneva and everything was calm and we were living in Switzerland, you could say, look, this guy's got a very tough uh, shake. Um, but, you know, he, he's got constraints. Of course he's got constraints. But, you know, God knows Winston Churchill had constraints uh, during the Second World War. You know, he was elected leader 
he wasn't even elected. His party was completely opposed to him by, in the main. He was appointed by the king on the advice of some magic circle. And most of the Conservative Party in Parliament were much more sympathetic to Neville Chamberlain, who'd been ousted to make way for him than they were for Churchill. And, you know, he was fighting a, a proper war, not, not a sort of phony war, you know, as, as we fighting against an invisible virus by comparison. So, yeah, of course, I, I understand the constraints, but we don't have time. And, and one of the points that I made is, you know, since Cyril Ramaphosa came into power, we were put on notice by the rating agency. So when we got our, and, and two of them downgraded us, and the third one happened really rather sadly on the uh, day that he imposed the national state of disaster last March, almost a year ago, we then were downgraded to junk by the third and final uh, agency uh, Moody's. But he had two years warning from when he became president and he didn't introduce the reforms that would have staved off that and made the cost of borrowing so expensive. So Peter, yeah, I, you know, and, and when I started writing this book at the end of 2019, I, I, I just made a note and I had it then had to change a figure. We were, the borrowing costs, what the government had to pay just to keep the ship of state afloat was a billion rand every working day. When this book, when I started ending this book last November, that we finished it finally in January, the borrowing cost had doubled to two billion rand a day. Now that that is really, we're directly heading into the jaws of a debt trap, what uh, Tito calls into the you know jaws of a hippo. And so we don't have time to say, well, I feel your pain, I understand you. You've actually got to take what you've got and you've got to go forward. And you know, I always used to quote when I was in politics, it actually sounds much better in Afrikaans from English because it's more dramatic. You know what Esther, in the book of Esther, she said, uh, if I perish, then I perish. I mean, you've got to sort of take a stand, do what's necessary. And if you do that, even if, you know, you desert it temporarily by, you know, whatever faction, you'll carry the whole country with you. I mean, if Cyril could start turning this around, which is in some of his power to do, you have a very grateful voting public, whichever party you represented. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Susan asks um, a more sort of hopeful question. Hi, Tony. Given the DA's governance in the cities it runs, is this not a way forward and a ray of hope for our country? Well, Susan, you know, absolutely. Compared to what? I mean, you'd much. I live in a DA-controlled city, Cape Town. It's uh, they, they're certainly the pavement. I will, uh, it's, it's not perfect by any means, Susan. Believe me, I have a lot of, you might say they're moaning minis. There are a lot of people in the suburbs who don't think that much of the governance of the city of Cape Town. But, you know, it, it's fantastic compared to Joburg or um, uh, other places where the ANC is in power. And so I think it is. But, you know, I think the DA has got to do more to demonstrate the DA difference. I, I don't think the DA always shoots the lights out where it does govern. And once again, you know, you can say the same thing that we that Peter Dutois just asked about Cyril. Well, they're constraints. They don't control the civil service. They, they have difficulty implementing the agenda. But I'm not sure they always have the best people in positions of administration. I'm not sure that the without, you know, politicizing the civil service, I, I don't know that the public servants understand what a DA agenda is. I'm not talking about, you know, awarding contracts to X. I'm talking about what is the governing philosophy? Is, is it pro-development, pro-business, pro-poor? Is it just sort of business as usual? We don't steal the money, which they don't do generally, and we generally worry about sound administration. Um, so I, I think they've, you know, they, they, they could demonstrate even better. And I think some of the administrations have a mixed bag. You know, I'm not sure about the administration and Chwani. I, I don't know how brilliant that was when the DA had it. Probably much better than what came after it for a while. And, you know, Nelson Mandela Bay, well, that, that keeps yo-yoing between two. And uh, Johannesburg, well, there were an enormous number of complaints uh, that we received, just as our panel, about the administration of Herman Mashaba uh, when he was mayor. And well, you could, and Herman Shop said, "Well, I I was doing what the DA told me to do, and I that that might well be so." And and I governed according to their prescripts. But in a sense, were there people in the DA who were paying enough attention to how the cities were being administered? So I think, in general, you're correct. It is a ray of hope, but I think that ray could be shining much brighter than it sometimes does. 
There's a related question from Darren, who says, where do you see the opposition, more particularly the DA and the EFF, within the foreseeable future? Will we see a realignment of politics in South Africa? Yeah, I think there will be a heart and fall. Uh, Darren, I do interrogate that in the last chapter of my book uh, under a section called Judgment Day. So uh, um, I, I look at the evidence, as such as we have it, and make some speculative comments. So I think you'll find some thoughts on it there. It's a related, another related question, I suppose, Tony. What from from low? I, I don't or low accounts. I'm not sure if that's a um, a person or a, a profile. Um, Tony, what should the DA be doing to exploit the weakened position the ANC is currently in? So I suppose everyone's looking to the future to see <laughs> what's going to be happening. Well, you know, there was a there was a senator um, in in America who said, "When your opponent's shooting himself in the foot, don't take away his gun." I think it was really good advice. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't, uh, the, the DA mustn't uh, keep a running commentary on all the battles taking place in the ANC because uh, they'll do a pretty good job of, you know, blowing themselves up at the, at the rate they're going. And, you know, uh, the, the John uh, Stiernazen came a lot of criticism for this interview last week. I didn't understand what all the fuss was about, but uh, that's another matter, which I interrogated yesterday, as Valdemar said in the Sunday Times. Um, but uh, the, the, the truth of the matter is, I'm sure it was, you know, gift wrapped by Pandora, as far as the ANC was concerned, John's offer that uh, they would, uh, the DA would 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 support a Ramaphosa administration, not a DD Mabuza or an Ace Makashula one, which incidentally about 99.2 of all sane South Africans would also support. But um, but sometimes you, but you get asked a question, unfortunately, in politics, as now you've got to answer them. But sometimes I think you've got to, you know, worry less about your opponents and worry more about your own prospects. And uh, to exploit the weakness, you've got to actually show your own strength sometimes, not just concentrate on your opponent's weaknesses. Uh, Daniel Silk asks, or says, always a pleasure to listen to Tony. To what degree has the dependency on income grants handouts contributed to a sustained ANC vote due to the fear of losing such benefits under the opposition? Yeah, Daniel, thank you very much. Daniel is a, is, a, is a seriously good speaker. We've actually shared platforms over the years, and it's nice to see you, Daniel, at least virtually, as I only see people these days. Um, yeah, I think this big issue. Look, I mean, if you remember, I, 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 it, 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 was, it was gifted to posterity, posterity, so naturally it appears in the book. I mean, Cyril Ramaphosa, long before he became president, I think it was 2013, said, oh, if you go and vote for the opposition, you'll bring the Boers back. You know, the apartheid comes back with the opposition, which is complete calumny. And I'm sure because we're not there, not only is the ANC you know, um, tell people their grants are going to be taken away, um, the uh, the ANC furthermore uh, goes around handing out taxpayer-funded food parcels election times, just to make the point not just clear, but abundantly clear. I, I remember, you know, the biggest uh, ovations I ever got in townships uh, when I was the leader, and it's a long time ago, was when we led a campaign for the basic income grant, which seemed a bit contrarian uh, for a, a liberal free market party. But actually, Ken Andrew, who was our excellent finance spokesman, put together the figures that, that did these things and said how this could be funded and what we'd have to do to make it happen. Now, of course, people only listen to the half they want to hear that we're going to get a basic income grant. They don't hear, well, actually, we're going to sell off a lot of state assets. But I think if you make a credible case, you can make a popular case, not just for the opposition, but for the free market, you can make it more inclusive. You can make it more expansive. I, I mean, you just have to look at what the Tories are doing in Britain right now, or indeed uh, what the Republicans, even among the Democrats, are voting for. Uh, their, their voters want with uh, with an expanded uh, social welfare system in the United States, which, which I think 66% of all voters support Biden's huge package. Now, can you do it in a sustainable way? I think the opposition's got to first do the maths, and they've done it, and not just on the hoof as they did on one occasion, and then they've got to take the case. Uh, and then they can, can make the case, but they've also got to do it in a fiscally responsible way, otherwise they'll have no credibility. But I think Daniel's point is true. I, but I, I think the opposition can make a better case without just getting into a populist bidding war. I suppose that sort of also relates to David's question. He says... What role does ideology play in influ influencing ANC policy? Is the National Democratic Revolution mere rhetoric, or is it the, a lodestar of government policy? 
Well, David, that's an excellent question. I, I spend a lot of my book uh, dealing with that national democratic revolution. And, you know, once again, because <laughs> I was present at the creation, not of the NDR, which is a good old Soviet trope, but uh, when it was introduced in modern democratic South Africa, and, you know, a lot of cat calls and whistles were so what, uh, when we started unpacking that agenda, and it is absolutely real. I, I mean, the, the thing about the ANC, and we've got to give them credit for this, they don't hide their lights under a bushel. It's not that they suddenly sprung on South Africa. You know, F.W. de Klerk was correctly, though thank heavens, accused by F.W. by Van Zell Slavitt in 1994 of selling out everything the National Party had held near India since 1948 with that speech, which I spent some time interrogating, and its uh, thermonuclear intensity. So it was a complete surprise. There was absolutely no mandate for what de Klerk did in 1990, and thank heavens he did. The ANC has put out in, with granular particularity what they intend to do. Now, sometimes they don't do it all, and that's always I hope that they don't implement it. We still have diplomatic relations with Israel, incidentally. That was going to be uh, removed, um, but it hasn't happened. Uh, so that's one example, and that would very much fit into their idea of NDR as foreign policy. But, um, you know, they put it out there. Uh, the most extraordinary thing to me is not what the ANC says. It's how, as they say in Afrikaans, you know, people say, I, I mean, I, I point out the, the fairly radical 2019 general election manifesto. Business Leadership South Africa, the organized voice of big business, not those small, you know, corner cafes, but the big business, supported it. So it was a very good manifesto except for saying about the Reserve Bank. And the four biggest uh, investment fund managers in this country thought it was excellent, even though it actually mandated, they haven't done it yet, prescribed assets, taking away people's pensions and savings and shoving them into bankrupt state-owned companies. And then the business said it was a wonderful manifest. I mean, yeah. So, it, yeah, I think the NDR is big stuff, and I think it should be taken seriously. But, you know, it doesn't always get implemented. That's our salvation. I haven't seen uh, David was at university with me, so I just want to say hi, David. It's been a while. I haven't seen you for ages. <laughs> um, we haven't. The questions have been coming in thick and fast since we've started having the Q and A, but I think we have time for one more um, from Douglas Gibson, which is sort of a pointed question, which I, I think is quite um, a nice one to end with. Um, he says, "Like Spike Milligan, I'm glad you seem to think rather better of me than Alex Borain." quoted in the new Slubbock book describing me as a nasty man, which is um, you moderated that uh, launch about a week and a half ago. You can watch that on the reading list as well. It's in, our, it's in the, our Facebook videos if anyone would like to go back and watch that. Fascinating reading, especially yours. Congratulations on a major contribution to contemporary political writing. And what is your next book to be about? Oh, Douglas, you know, let's, get, let's see if there needs, uh, how we do on this book. I, I don't know. The thought... You know, my wife said to me, if, if, if everyone remembered how painful it was to give birth to one child, the world would be full of one child families. But most people in the world have more than one children and have children. So, um, yeah, I, the, 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 there's a lot of agony in, in the creation. And although this is a, you know, my first book was 707 pages. And this is only 292. But I mean, you know, I... I because of my excellent editor, who was very, very merciless, and my publisher, Jeremy Brain, uh, I lost 25,000 words on the cutting room floor, had to be removed. So um, I, it's like killing your babies, Charles von Onslow calls it. Well, you've got to start on the next one then. So I put the no, no, there, there are too many books, Jennifer, no names, no pectoral, <laughs> which I see them as they come out of that. Ah, that was cut out of your last book, and now you shoved it together as the next book. So <laughs> this book, at least, although there, there are a lot of references here, was an original take, or my take. Um, the next book, I don't know, maybe I'll write a romantic fiction. I believe they sell very well. <laughs> Especially in Afrikaans. Yes, a roman in, in Afrikaans. <laughs> or, for, or for a recept, a book fund recept. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, really <laughs> book, yeah. <laughs> I'll hand back over to Voldemar now for any uh, closing remarks, comments. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much. Tony, if you were to write in Afrikaans, hey, Roman, what on earth would the title of that book be? <laughs> well, I, I, read think. About, I read about my political marriage with Van Skalpek. You can do the Afrikaans. I called it uh, A Marriage Made in Hell. I don't know. That, that might be quite a good title for a uh, <laughs> uh, book, me. But, you know, my, my personal marriage has been better than some of my political marriages. That's, I'm happy to report. 
Uh, Tony, just in conclusion for me, um, you, you reference uh, 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 Emmanuel Macron's movement en marche in France, which uh, took the establishment parties by storm some years back, um, to many people's surprise. Do we not need a new vehicle in this country to, um, to shake up opposition politics? It's possible. I look, I've never been married to names. I mean, I was a foot soldier for the old Progressive Party, which became the PRP, the PFP, the DP, the DA, usually adding people on. I mean, Helen Zilla once terse reminded me that I once said we must become a party of addition, not a party of division. And, and you know, that was one of my, my slogans, and it, it happens to be true. So, you know, I, I don't fall in love with names or symbols or slogans. I, I, I think, you know, you've got to adapt to the circumstances. So it might be that there will be another movement and provided it's founded with the right values and it stands for the right sort of things and it can advance where current parties can't, by all means, I, I wouldn't write off. And, you know, that's why I, I haven't, you know, I haven't been, if, if I was a sort of a, a bitter ender, as they say, I, I would probably not have become the leader of the DA. I put a lot of people's backs up when we merged the NNP with the DP. I mean, that was two historic enemies and yet the DA wouldn't govern the Western Cape or the city of Cape Town, if we hadn't made that marriage uncomfortable, made people feel there was no DA. If, if I'd said to you 25 years ago, well, there's going to be a new party and the, the basis of it's going to be the National Party, the Democratic Party, you would have said, ach, niemand. And yet it happened. And electorally, and I think overall, it's been a successful project. But if it reaches some kind of sell-by date, then it must be reinvented for current new purposes. Tony, thank you very, very much. And I really enjoyed I really enjoyed your book. I remember Accidental Ambassador was my holiday reading in Thailand many years ago. <laughs> very uh, unlikely accompaniment, but it was uh, really fantastic to, um, uh, to see your assessment of where we are and see that there are some glimmers of hope. Uh, the best and the worst never happen in South Africa is another uh, uh, famous political quote that you, that you reference. Um, and thank you so much for the conversation. I hope the book sells very well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Valdemar, for your excellent questions. Jennifer for hosting us. Jonathan Ball for publishing. And all of you folk out there listening, I really appreciate it. Watching. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, Tony, I don't know if you're on YouTube, but there's been a couple more questions on YouTube if you want to at some point go and have a look at what people have been saying and perhaps uh, jump in with uh, uh, yeah. some words of wisdom. No, 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 no. <laughs> inside here. The That's true as well, yeah. <laughs> everyone go and buy a copy at once. It's available online. And um, in all good books, well, in all bookstores, probably good and bad. I don't know if there's such a thing as a bad bookshop, but uh, it's available everywhere. Um, and thank you very much to Jonathan Bull Publishers for setting this up. We had a, um, a really uh, interesting chat, I think, this evening. And thanks to Voldemar for some great questions. And to Tony for writing the book. Thanks so much. Thank you. Good thanks night. Thanks so much. Good, good night. night.